Okay, okay, so so let me ask you a question. If there were no if if there was no government, would you murder people? If there is no government, would I murder people? Um it would completely depend on my survi- my uh environment. So like let's say there was a situation in which in order to uh, for me to survive, I had to kill a person, right? Let's say we were lived in some like barbaric time back before, you know, uh, there was all of this, um, you know, um, what do you call it? Uh, politically correct and all this, you know, back back in a time where, like, in order for me to survive, I I don't know, th- there was just people that hated me and were armed, and if I didn't kill them, then they killed me. Then maybe, maybe okay. I would have to. I mean, I wouldn't want to probably, but okay. I, I may have okay. to. Okay. Well, well, essentially, what I'm asking is, <clears throat> is the reason that you don't kill people? Because there's a law, or because you you morally understand it to be wrong, and this is like very hard to separate, right? Like, how much of me is because of societal upbringing and because of what society thinks is correct, and how much of me is what I independently think is correct? I mean, I don't think that naturally I'm a very like uh, aggressive person. I don't think I like aggressively try to push people around or like try to I don't think I would be able to justify to myself that like killing a, another person was correct for whatever reason but that's not everyone obviously I mean we still have murdering going on in our current society and it's outlawed right exactly so, <laughs> exactly exactly which which to me illustrates the the fundamental um um, <clears throat> uselessness of laws themselves right so the idea so, that if we just make a law for something it's mm-hmm. gonna it's gonna prevent that or hinder it <laughs> is completely uh, well it naive. does i mean <laughs> because yeah, i mean if people i, I get, mean it does though like <clears throat> it reminds me it reminds as soon me, as government like, disappears like take um take the af- aftermath of katrina right in new orleans like as basically that was a situation where the only people that were around were non-government agencies and it was sort of like chaos like there was all these abandoned buildings with goods in them and when there's nobody around to watch over those buildings and make sure that the things aren't taken out of those buildings, I mean, people that wouldn't normally steal had the opportunity to steal and not face any repercussion over it, right? And, yep. like, it wasn't government that made them do it. It wasn't, like, some external force was saying, hey, go loot those buildings and take everything that's inside. It was, hey, nobody's around to watch this stuff. The owners of the businesses aren't there. The police aren't here. Nobody's watching. I'm just going to take this stuff and nobody's going to really find out about who it was. So they just did it. And uh, I think that laws to, like, to say that this stuff will be punished if done does prevent some people from doing things that uh, we generally consider to be in society a bad thing, TM. You know, I think it does have preventative force. I completely okay. disagree with you on that. Well, there's a, there's a quote by Plato. Uh, he said... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, good people do not need laws to act responsibly, and bad people will always find ways around the laws, right? So, so the idea that uh, that a law will prevent a particular action is uh, <laughs> is not necessarily true because, because they find people, ways to get around the laws if, until they get caught. I mean, people do things that are against the law and get caught all the time. I mean, true. it does have ways of preventing their negative influence from affecting society over much. I mean, they may get away with it one or two times, but eventually a lot of these chronic, you know, criminals do get caught and put in jail and there are positive effects from that. And a prime, to me, a prime example of the, uh, not only the fundamental uselessness of laws, but of the destru- entirely destructive nature that they wreak on society is um, the intemperance laws, the alcohol intemperance laws of the 1920s, right, which mm-hmm. which which directly stimulated the creation of um, of the mafia, right, <laughs> at that time, and and the you know, underground underground uh, you know bootleg. Oh, I don't know creation. about all that. I don't know about the history of the mafia, so I can't really counter argue you on that. But actually, I think that the prohibition laws are a perfect example of a de- democratic system working, right? Like a a law got created that society wasn't really able to uphold enough people were against the entire idea of the law a couple of years went by and hey look the law got revoked right so like the system basically a couple of people put their interests into government uh it went into practice it didn't work out the people found out that it wasn't working and it got revoked right so like that's kind of a uh, an example of law law creation 
being overturned and sort of society recovering from an ill-made law. Recovering until the drug laws started, right? And then, and then, the, and then the black market starts once again. <laughs> well, so <clears throat> uh, I guess that brings the whole argument like what's better, like outlawing something that has negative effect on society or allowing it to exist and allowing those negative repercussions to play themselves out, right? So like your whole thing about victimless crime laws, which I'm, uh, I totally disagree with, Let, let's start talking about that, sure. right? Sure, go ahead again. So I think <clears throat> I brought this up to you before of a victimless crime is drunk driving, right? So <clears throat> you're driving a car, you're getting drunk, where's the victim, right? There's no victim, mm -hmm. it's just me and my car getting drunk. Well, the victim comes when you and your car getting drunk slams into another car of a person not drunk, and then we have to deal with that. So is it better to let all of these drunk driving accidents happen and then prosecute the people that create these accidents? Or is it better to take a preventative measure and say, okay, let's, step, let's take one step back instead of punishing the uh, accidents that occur because of the drunk driving, let's punish the actual act of drunk driving itself, right? And so long as this law is um, relatively uniformly um, applied, you're preventing, you're preventing these situations that cause the accidents from happening in the first place um, and preventing the injuries that occur from them uh, while still punishing the same <clears throat> criminals, right? So uh, what, what, what are your uh, responses to that? Okay, so, so drunk driving laws, right? Um, mm-hmm. Uh, the way I see drunk driving laws, um, if a person is um, <laughs> idiotic enough to drink until wasted and then get, get behind the wheel of a, of a car, massive machine, you know, metal machine that is capable yep. of doing, you know, enormous damage. Which um, people are, are capable of doing. You're yeah. right. Yeah, people mm -hmm. are capable of doing. So if, if somebody is idiotic enough to do that, um, yeah. I, I don't think the existence of a piece of paper scribbles on a piece of paper is going to deter him if he doesn't even care about his own life, right? So he doesn't get behind the wheel of a car. A guy like that doesn't get behind the wheel of a car and think, you know what? There's a law against drunk driving. Maybe I shouldn't do this. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. But look, So what, what I'm saying but, but is... But here's the hold difference, on, right? Hold on, hold on, wait, hold on, let me finish. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, they're willing to put their life on the line, right? They don't care about the... Forget about the law. They don't even care about their own life, right? So, sure. So, so... Um, to me, what that kind of law succeeds in doing is punishing people who are competent and who are aware that maybe, okay, maybe they did have a little bit to drink, but they're completely fine. They can drive, many people completely drive home with a little bit of alcohol in their blood and no problem, no accidents or anything. But if one uh -huh. of those people get pulled over by a cop, all of a sudden they owe the government $200, right? Because uh -huh. because they drank uh, you know a glass of wine, right? So okay. it, it only succeeds in robbing people of their. Okay. Currency, is what I'm saying. So one thing is, what if you're able to set the threshold of the law such that we're only punishing people who basically cannot be legally okay to drive? Like if we're punishing people at you know 0.9 or whatever blood alcohol content, and there's just no way that you are driving a car and are able to actually manage driving that car responsibly, then that kind of eliminates the case where, hey, I'm driving a car and I, I'm totally fine. That eliminates the case that you brought up, right? If, if we're able to set the threshold of the law properly, then that kind of eliminates that particular case. The other thing is the existence of the victimless crime law allows you to do pr like preventative enforcement. So like before you get to the car accident where the innocent person is either killed or severely harmed, I'm able to stop your irresponsible act and punish it there rather than waiting for you to slam into someone. And then I can, you know, take action. I'm able to take action when you're in the state that would cause the accident. And like as an innocent bystander of someone who never drives drunk, there is a benefit to having a law in place where if people are driving irresponsible, not safe, I'm happy with the fact that those people can be caught before they slam into me. Like, I want that law to be in place because I want drunk driving to be punished, not slamming into somebody at, while I'm drunk driving. Okay. I don't want that to be punished. I want the, the, state, the state of drunkness while driving, I want that to be punished. All right. So, so it seems like what you are essentially doing is uh, trying to predict – well, two things. Trying to predict the future – 
and trying to enact a completely 100% safety society. <laughs> completely, you know, like, uh, how you say, um, a society with no risk, I guess. So, uh, so the way not I, no risk, but I want reduced risk reduced in risk, certain yeah. circumstances when possible. Yes. Okay. So the danger with with you know pre <laughs> so essentially what you what you're talking about have you have you seen the movie Minority Report? Tom yeah. Cruise. Okay. So I think that's essentially back, what yeah. what victimless crimes are aiming to do, right? In that they are trying to predict the future. In that you know you will you will uh, cause damage. You will hit someone, you will kill someone, and so I have to, um, you know, um, rob you now or, or kidnap you or arrest you or cage you now uh, before you do that, right? Which is a very mm -hmm. difficult path to go down because where does that lead? You know, how, how far down the path of, you know, pre-crime do you want to go? I mean, like, I'm not interested in predicting the future, but <laughs> if I can do statistical analysis, analysis that says once people start drinking beyond a certain point, they are 200% more likely to cause an accident. If we can do the statistical analysis and say, hey, if we can get more people that are drunk off the roads, we're going to save more lives, then heck yeah, I'm interested in, in that risk prevention and benefiting the more responsible members of society by getting the irresponsible people off the road. Yes, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it kind of seems strange because it's like, what, what, what would be the... Uh the end result, you know, having police officers in bars, you know, watching how many drinks you have or monitoring your blood before you leave the bar or what? For sure. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> cutoffs, right? This, you know? <laughs> there, there, there are boundaries which we are not willing to go, in, over which we're not willing to go as a society for, there's always two extremes. There's uh, complete and total freedom and no restrictions on behavior. And then there's the other extreme where we have a police state where everybody must do as society says, and you're, you're completely have your own personal freedom. So there is two extremes there. And I, I think you can move the bar slightly in one direction or the other without completely going to one side or the other. It's, it's, there is a, uh, there are different extremes and there's a middle ground and, I think the the difficulty of and finesse that is required with which to structure laws is the finesse of balancing those two extremes of saying, hey, look, we don't want to take away everyone's freedoms, but there are certain extreme risky behaviors that can endanger others if allowed to continue. Uh, th that is where we that is the middle ground we can step into and say, hey, look, you can go up to this far as soon as you go this far we're taking away the keys because that's that you're at that point you're endangering many other people at your own, your own small amounts of personal freedom. I, I do not want to like, I, I'm fine with you getting drunk in your own person, your own home. You're not really endangering other people in that situation. But once you get behind the wheel, that is the point at which society is going to say, Hey, look, like if we allow this, we're, we're endangering many other people at the expense of one person's, Small amounts of freedom. That is where we need to draw the line. Or how about people who uh, who drive with a cigarette and a, and a coffee, or or reading the paper, or shaving while they're driving? I'm sure that's mm -hmm. that's pretty dangerous as well, right? So we're, we're, how do you? Uh, <laughs> I'm sure that can well, be easily cause an or texting at the same time while you're driving. And, and and those those types of actions are actually punished to a certain. Like if you are driving negligently, there are laws against that that say, hey, look, you're going to be responsible for this accident, like. You know, like uh, if you're, you know, shaving while driving, that's that's irresponsible too. And if, if you cause accidents while doing that, and it's provable, then uh, you're going to have to face the uh, oh, no, punishment. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that that I understand. That like if there, there's an accident, and let's say you had witnesses that say, you know, this guy was texting, or this guy had, you know, a cigarette and a coffee in his hand. Sure, I can definitely understand that. Um, but mm -hmm. so 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 my whole my whole approach with anarchy and volunteerism is. Basically, that um, to encourage people to have responsibility for their own actions, right? To right. take ownership of themselves, to to not blame mm -hmm. the consequences of their decisions on other people, right? Regardless right. of what what those con regardless of what those decisions are, you know, decisions. Yeah, you're hoping that everyone plays nice in your no, in your little no, 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 no. your no, little I'm sandbox. Not. No, mm -hmm. I'm not. Definitely not. You know, I I, I fully understand that that there are going to be you know there are going to be. Uh, Crazy people, insane people, people who you know who, who try to con other people, you know, 
uh, try mm-hmm. to control other people, subjugate other people. But what I'm saying is that I, I, um, <laughs> I completely understand those, the existence of those people. However, I do not think that uh, they're in the majority, all right? They're in the minority. Mm-hmm. And if they are in the majority, <laughs> then we have different problems, right? But mm-hmm. I, I really do uh, understand them to be in the significant minority. Um, and so, you know, they, they, they don't really, they don't really uh, frighten me whatsoever. Um, but, okay. but, but, yeah, that's, that's essentially, you know, with anarchy is, is that everybody everybody must take control of their own lives and the consequences of their own decisions, right? So if you, mm-hmm. if you have a business and you choose, you know, you'd say, you, you know, your business is successful, you know, you sell a lot of products, you get, you know, you gain a large market share, right? And then you take some of that and you gamble it, I don't know, somewhere uh, <laughs> on, on, a, on another business and you lose all that money, okay? So there's nobody there to bail you out. There's nobody there to give you a subsidy. There's nobody there to artificially prop you up, right? And, and rightfully uh-huh. so, because that was your money. You made a conscious choice to invest it, and you lost, right? Why mm-hmm. should anybody be, um, you know, bear the burden of your faulty decisions, right? I don't expect anyone mm-hmm. to bear the burden of my faulty decisions, right? So, so mm-hmm. the, this is the essence of, um, of, you know, of anarchy, is that people are empowered, to run their own lives, to be their own masters, to be their own rulers, and that when you have a society of government, you inevitably have, you know, favoritism, and you have uh, regulatory capture, you have lobbying, you have bribery, you have, you know, these are not things that are new, these are not things that are novel, these are things that are built into the system, <clears throat> and I, I don't think that um, there, there is. Mm-hmm. I don't think that there's an optimal government. I don't think that there's a change that we need to make. It's not about who's in. It's not about who's ruling. It's not about what kind of foreign policy we have. What kind of <clears throat> economic policy? What kind of interest rate we should have? No, <laughs> you know, it's about allowing people the freedom to transact with each other freely, uh-huh. right? And with with the full understanding. That there is risk in freedom, right? There is risk. Mm-hmm. You know, we 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 um we have risk every day. You know, like <clears throat> sure. So so the other thing is that that's, that I wanted to point out is that um, even though we are all immersed in this state of society, we all do have a significant amount of of, of anarchy in our in our society. For example, you know, you wake up when you want. Essentially, you know, <laughs> say the weekend, right? You mm-hmm. you choose the job that you want, right? You choose. You choose, mm-hmm. um, you know, the profession that you want. You choose. Mm-hmm. We make a lot of decisions on our own that have nothing whatsoever to do with government, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we essentially we really do um, have a small portion of our lives where we actually interact with government. You know, maybe it, you, when you do your taxes, or let's say you got stopped by a police officer. So, so most of the times we we don't really or go go to DMV, right? So, I I I, I think that most of the time we are living anarchically. We are living. And and also even you know like let's say you go to the mall right. Well, you know, I would say that you're living as mostly a free person where you've conceded that certain things uh, that could be free should not be free for the so that we can enforce uh, well so that we can um, so I mean certain things if we were allowed to do them would negatively impact others so mm-hmm. basically yeah we're mostly free but. Um, We've conceded a, a few things, right, so that yeah. um, other people aren't negatively impacted by those decisions. But uh, continue. So, so, so what, what what I'm saying is, like, you know, for the most part, we do live as in we are living in anarchy. Like, for example, police officers, the law enforcement, they do not prevent crime. Okay, they arrive after the fact. All right, a murder happens, they arrive afterwards. They do they do paperwork. You know, sometimes they prevent. Sometimes they yeah, prevent. Okay, maybe they do. In the significant minority, they prevent. But most of the mm-hmm. time, they are paper pushers. They arrive after the fact, okay? And let's say you walk to the mall, right? You know, what's to stop anybody from shooting you or killing or, or you know, stabbing you or whatever, or beating you up? There is really nothing to stop them, right? Um, and, and so, right. in, in, essence, in, right. in, in essence, we do live anarchically, right? Um, because, you know, somebody could kill you, but of course, you know, then... Then somebody will call the cops, and they they run after that guy. So, but but what I'm saying is, we every day rely on the um, inherent benevolent nature 
of humanity all the time. You know, whenever you go out into into society, whenever you go into large areas of uh, when, when large groups of people gather, you know, this uh -huh. this is <laughs> this is um, how society would be absent government. I think it wouldn't be very much different. Than I mean, today. oh, well, I mean, you have to. I mean, you really have to separate how people behave every day from whether or not government would exist, right? Like, so, I mean, if, if there wasn't, um, if there weren't laws and the means by which to enforce these laws, like how much of this behavior would change in certain individuals, right? Like you're saying the inherent benevolent nature of human beings, I say our, in our inherent behavior is not necessarily benevolent or evil like it's not one or the other and so i really don't think that you should be using that term I, I don't think that it's accurate people are trying to survive like we're basically <clears throat> we are just you know living beings that uh we've grown up through the process of evolution we have grown into a position of superiority over our environment um we don't have any predators but basically <clears throat> that inherent need to survive is still there and some people are able to compromise morals to further their own survival and some aren't right and so i don't think that you know if you took away all laws and all police and suddenly we're all living in an anarchistic society i don't believe as many people would behave the way that they behave today some people would continue behaving normally and able to deal with the presence of others and the presence of people of other races and sizes and colors and all these other things some people would deal with that just fine like you and me and some people wouldn't. And uh, so I, I think that you need to be able to like, in your mind, you need to be able to separate what is being caused by the existence of government and society and what is not. I don't, th I don't agree with your conclusions there. Okay. Uh, well, another thing that I, w I, I see in a stateless society is that um, I would assume everyone would be armed, <laughs> first of all, because since there is no you know, law enforcement, state-supported state, uh, state law enforcement uh -huh. that we would all believe um, to be protecting us, I think everyone would basically have basic weapons about them at all times. And mm -hmm. I think that the existence of that would necessarily produce uh, lower crime. <laughs> because what is the use of a person in a well-armed, um, you know, where everybody is well-armed, what is the use of one person trying to you know, murder a few people when they know they're going to them. They're them. They themselves are going to get murdered as well, right? So the the mm -hmm. the reduction, significant reduction of crime as a result of being well armed. And, and I mean, this is this is um, you know, a phenomenon that, that has been uh, it's it's noticed in in um, in in many cities uh, across the United States. I think uh, I think Chicago has one of the highest gun control, uh, strictest gun control laws, and they have the highest. Um, you know, gang violence and criminality as well. So, mm -hmm. in general, a a armed society is a polite society, right? Um, and so, so yeah, so so that's the first thing. And the the second thing is, I, I definitely do agree with you that um, you know, hu human nature is not fundamentally good or fundamentally evil. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I I definitely do think that there is um, it's human conditioning more more accurately said that uh, people. Um, embody the ideals that they grew up in, you know. So, so you know, a, a child growing up in the in the <laughs> KKK household will be racist, racist, right? A child growing up in France will speak French. <clears throat> a child growing up in the Amish country will be an Amish person, right? So there is no, you know, mm -hmm. there is no absolute um, <clears throat> nature of man. So it's 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 genuinely malleable, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I agree, I agree with to you. an extent, right? So like. People are influenced by their environment, but sometimes people come out of a good environment and turn out to be not so good people and vice versa. Like people are influenced by their backgrounds, but are not completely uh, subject to them. I mean, uh, people, uh, it has, there's a lot to do with it. And we're still discovering more about the human brain and the human psychology. Um, it's not a completely explored field, completely solved field, but my belief uh, because it still has to be a belief because there's not sufficient evidence to support one one or the other is that there's a little bit of both. So there's some biology in there, some just basically how you're wired in your brain, you know, how, um, you know, and that's partly through mental development as a child and as an adult, you know, there's mental development going on there, but there's also just some biological facts. Like if you're born with a smaller, you know, 
uh, let's say gray matter section of the brain or whatever, that's going to affect you as a person uh, as well as sort of like your background, your education, your parents and all these other factors. I think it's, it's a con- conglomeration of everything. It's, there's biology in there as well as psychology. So um, I don't think that people are completely a, um, a function of their environment. So mm-hmm. if you're going to say that we're going to live in an anarchist society and, and uh, if everyone gets along, then we're going to produce people with less criminal behavior or something. I, I don't think that that's a conclusive argument that you can have. I, I think that there's a lot of room to argue in there. So yeah. um, <clears throat> what I will say, though, is that um, I think that um, – you can't count on everyone being able to afford to be armed. And I don't think you can count on everyone to be able to be aff- uh, afford to be armed with as many people behind them. You know, uh, CEO of a large business, for example, is going to be able to command a lot more people than you're going to be able to as a independent farmer, let's say. Right. And so like, if I decide I want more farmland for my business and I, I have sufficient military might with which to secure your farmland without you being able to do much about it, uh, that that isn't exactly a very fair society in my mind, and I think that those types of things would eventually occur. People with a lot of money being able to throw their weight around, uh, and without any sort of uniform way of stopping that behavior. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, actually, the the argument that in a stateless society that. Um, you know, some people say you know a warlord would come up and and control everyone, or a CEO would would gain access to resources and buy up all the weapons and tanks and everything, and control everyone. That that kind of argument to me um, is similar to you know we should not we should not like as a, let's say a doctor would would tell a patient you know I shouldn't try to cure you of your cancer because you might get cancer in the future again. I shouldn't I shouldn't go to the gym. And try to work out and lose weight because I might get fat and flabby again in the future. <laughs> um, so I mean, so, so, so if you think if so, if I think that the situation that would be caused by allowing businesses to basically have their own military, if I if I think that that future is a worse future than the future of the now, then I don't necessarily want your future. That's that's the whole point. Agreed. Yeah, <laughs> we. Uh, I think we can agree on that. That uh, <laughs> we have a significant uh, amount of disagreement with uh, <laughs> the way we see. So let's talk about design. some of these. So let's talk about some of these like more difficult um, things to talk to um, to discuss. I think that um, I think one of the the things that's going to be difficult to accomplish is um, pri- like public defense, right? So national defense. So. How would how would national defense work in a society like yours? Um, all right, so y- you know, the, so the hypothetical situation of uh, you know, let's say a stateless society, uh, mm-hmm. you know, begins to develop. And by the way, a stateless society, uh, like like for example, you mentioned Katrina, right? And and that being equivalent to anarchy, um, whereas I wouldn't necessarily say it is because that's kind of like saying um, that we can produce. A you know a population that understands atheism and understands why religion is um, you know uh, uh, an illusion. If if we just murder all the priests and pastors and <laughs> and bishops, you know that will produce yeah. that will produce a somewhat. Um, society I know your absent, argument. Absent religion. I understand. Uh, okay. I understand your argument. What what you're saying is that if you have a government that's uh, sorry, if you have a society that's controlled by government, and then you suddenly take the government away, those people are of different quality than you would have in a society where there is no government to start with, and people are sort of brought up in a different way to understand how to operate within a society that has no government. So you, they wouldn't be just like randomly looting because they've grown up to understand that in order to cooperate in the society society in order to exist in this, this society you have to not loot when people are not watching you know what I mean? the, basically yeah. your argument okay yeah yeah i mean that's a very theoretical argument that i think is very difficult to support with any sort of facts but i, I mean i understand the the theory there um i'm not sure exactly if that would work out the way you're thinking but maybe so, so uh yeah yeah mm-hmm. so, so so essentially what i'm saying is is anarchy is not chaos right which is which is the, uh-huh. which is the uh the general understanding of what anarchy is. Anarchy simply means without rulers, right? You know, yeah, without government. Without yes. yeah, without rulers, not without rules, right? Because we always will live with 
um, rules, not necessarily rules that are man-made or arbitrarily written down by a small group of people, but rules of society, the laws of morality, right? These are not rules that were created by any one person. These are rules that we all commonly understand. Like, well, like no... so we can't say we all, right? Because everyone kind of has their own rules. I mean, without, without sort of like agreeing on any, anything, people kind of like just do what they want. Mm-hmm. And sometimes what they want is something that selfishly benefits themselves. So like if I know that I can double my income and there's not going to be any sort of like negative consequence to that, then I'll just double my income, right? But – uh, let's say that th- what you're doing is you're taking the farmland away from someone else and evicting them. Maybe you don't think that evicting that person from their farmland is a negative consequence as you as a person, right? So your own set of rules just say that I'm going to take what I want for survival. Those are your own personal rules and you personally agree that those things are okay, but most other people don't. And so like – Society without laws is basically a society with no rules because in order for there to be any rules, we all kind of have to agree that those rules are correct. If we don't all agree on anything, then we don't have a society is basically my argument is that without coming together and setting up anything that works for our mutual mutual benefit, then how can we realistically work together? Like whenever I work with someone else, let's say I want somebody to build a house for me. We, we both sign a contract like – I'm going to pay you this much, and at the end of the day, I'm going to have a house. We've signed a contract, and there's a bunch of laws and rules and things that we've both agreed upon in order to get this done. And so a society without sort of some sort of societal contract, without some sort of agreement upon the things that we all are going to do in order to make this a beneficial thing, without those laws, without those rules, we don't really have a society. We just have a bunch of people all living in the same area. And eventually, that just doesn't is not going to work out. But uh, okay, yeah. so so um, you know, let's say you 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 look back at uh, you know society, <laughs> you know when when governments were smaller, or we'll say you know stateless societies like um, I mean, they, I don't know if you can call them stateless societies, but let's say the Native American Indians, you know, of North America, um, uh-huh. you know, they did they did fight with each other, right? They did, um, yeah, you know. Um, you know, kill each other maybe over land, over resources, perhaps, right? Mm-hmm. So, so you can say that there is violence even in a society where there isn't a formalized institution of government, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you have to realize, or you have to, you have to uh, come to terms with the fact that the violence that is sanctioned by uh, government, <laughs> you know, is much, much. Worse, much graver, the amount of carnage and slaughter that happens as as a direct result of government forming. You know, again, coming back to the idea of sovereign immunity, that you know, when when a conquistador comes to this country and comes in the name of you know some some emperor an ocean away, you know, mm-hmm. he's free to you know do whatever he wants in the name of government, right? He's not a murderer, right? Or when a soldier goes into overseas to to Iraq or Afghanistan. And you know, um, you know, kills a bunch of uh, innocent uh, men, women, and children. You know, that's the war on terror, and it's not murder. So we have, you know, when you have the existence of government, you're skewing the laws of morality. You're distorting it for people. It's not, it's not clear anymore what is moral and what is not moral, right? And so that that is one of the primary problems I have is <laughs> is that government already has a history of being bloody. And murderous and genocidal, and I really I cannot see uh, I cannot see a society that would be much worse than that. <laughs> We've already been down in the ditches, you know, clawing at each other's necks over pieces of cloth, you know, and um, you know pledges of allegiance and pieces of paper we call constitutions, right? We've already done that, you know. I think it's time. That we, you know, start doing something a little bit different because obviously, 250 million people dying in the 20th century over a piece of cloth is not necessarily what I would call civilization. So I mean, I I mean I, I think we have a disagreement on what we would call success, right? So I mean, do you think that seven billion people living on the same 
planet the same piece of area compared to like, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands before we had government? Do you think that the growth from like 10, you know, tens of thousands of people to 7 billion, do you think that that is any form of success? Despite the negative things that have occurred, do you, do you think that, um, you know, solving the problems of, um, you know, s- diseases and uh, our technological advances and our explorations into space and our, the, you know, insane number of success stories that humanity has to share. Do you think that those are attributed to, at all to government? Or do you think that that has absolutely nothing to do with the formation of government and only the negative consequences of our history as human beings? Only, only those negative things are the consequences of government, right? None of the positive things, all the bad things. Yeah, so so a lot of people can point to, you know, you, like say NASA, you know, you know, we have this space exploration program. Look at that. That's wonderful. You know, it's government funded, right? We have, we have USPS. It's wonderful. You know, we can move pieces of paper around um, and without government, we wouldn't be able to move pieces of paper around, right? We have the Department of Education, right? It's wonderful. We're educating our kids. Without that, our kids would not be educated. Illiteracy would be rampant. <laughs> so, so the idea is that um, reality is, is optimal and that there is no other possibility that reality could have occurred absent, uh-huh. absent this coercive monopoly on violence known as government. So it, it's the idea of the broken window fallacy, which is... <clears throat> Which is that you know all this all this uh, resources and stolen money, stolen or, <laughs> you know that's debatable. But uh, not money, stolen. Okay, so mm-hmm. so currency was uh-huh. devoted towards space exploration by force, right? Mm-hmm. Rather than allowing, let's say, imagine imagine a world where there was competing <clears throat> space exploration companies. Now, so so the so big we, problem. We can't even imagine that, right? <laughs> well, hold on. I I think that. With so in this situation, you have a situation where government has put funds and money towards a goal that it is not immediately profitable, right? Like it is not profitable. Like back in the days where we were first uh, starting to explore space, uh, space, back in the days where we were first thinking about going to the moon, back in those days, the amount of expense that a private company would have to lay out in order to possibly get themselves off the planet and into space and possibly from there onto the moon was an incredible amount of money, just an insane amount of resources at the time for a specific private company, big or small, doesn't matter really what size, nobody was going there yet, right? It was just an insane uh, amount of resources to even think about accumulating to devoting to a project that has no... Uh, near immediate or near immediate uh, sort of profit to it, right? So therefore, no private company wanted to do that. There was nobody in the U.S., nobody in Russia, nobody in anywhere, any piece of the world that wanted to put those funds towards space exploration. So nobody did. And the U.S. government said, hey, you know what? I know it doesn't have any immediate profit. I know there's no foreseeable immediate benefit to doing this. But regardless of that fact we want to push towards space exploration. And so the government was this third party that has no bottom line profit in mind, no end game of making money off of this venture. Their goal was we want to get ourselves off this planet. We want to see, and we're going to do whatever it takes to get there. And so that was in a particular area in which government showed that, even though there's no like immediate benefit to doing this, we are going to decide to do it as a society and we're going to go get there and, and, you know, come what, whatever it takes, uh, we're going to get to the moon. And so I think that this is another, this is an area where government has shown that there are positive benefits to having a society, uh, like a structure outside of the private market, outside of the, um, the free market system, uh, by which we can accomplish things uh, as a group of people without profit in mind. Okay. Um, well, we should wrap this up. <laughs> it's getting a little, yeah, yeah, a little yeah. long. But um, all right. So I'll just I'll just finish up my remarks, and you can finish up your remarks, and we'll we'll finish. Okay. Up. Sure. Um, okay. So so as a response to that, um, I would say that that your idea that you know there is no profit to be made in you know this field or that field. I think is uh, extraordinarily, um, how you say, <laughs> presump- 
presumptuous. It, it, I'm not it, saying the, that there's the, zero profit in space exploration for the forever for like the entire rest of human existence. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that the amount of investment it would have taken a private company in order to get ourselves off the planet and to the moon was too high at the time. I mean, nobody did it, right? It wasn't like illegal to build a spaceship and go to the moon. Uh, anybody could have done it. It's just that private companies were not willing to foot the risk. And that's where government can come in and say, we're going to take that risk. We're not going to go out of business. Like we aren't so suddenly going to become not profitable if we do this. We're just going to, to do it because we as a society, as a group of people, and I know you're going to argue those points, but whatever. Uh, I'm going to use it because it's easier language to use and we have a short amount of time. But we uh, as a society are going to take this venture regardless of whether or not profit immediately generates from this. Okay. So, so, so what I would say is... Um, Same thing with public defense. Public okay. defense is not like a profitable venture, but we do it because we don't want Russians to kill us, basically. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so basically what I would say is um, the nature of business uh, and the free market is that, um, you know, you're right. It's all about profit, right? Profit mm -hmm. is the bottom line. It's the way that entrepreneurs um, and business owners understand how their uh, products and services are being received by the consumer, right? So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a feedback mechanism, right? So, mm -hmm. so when, a, when a business person creates a product or service that, that people actually want and are willing to voluntarily pay for, mm -hmm. then they get enor they're showered with enormous profits. And what this does is, you know, maybe he takes the profits, puts it back into his own business, builds his business, employs more people. So in turn, mm -hmm. cr increases the wealth of society, increases the standard of living of society, right? So... To say that profits only benefit the entrepreneur, I think, is is not to give it the full respect, right? Profit is, is something that benefits society as a whole, right? Like like Steve sure. Jobs, Steve Jobs, who created you know all of his products, he was he became extraordinarily extraordinarily successful, right? But right, that's sure. not to say that that's not at the expense of everyone else, right? He enriched sure. the lives of millions of people, right? So sure. in the same way. If something is not profitable or if something is too expensive and nobody is willing to voluntarily pool their capital or resources into making a business out of it, for example, let's mm -hmm. say space, um, <laughs> to force people to do it by means of government, and yes, mm -hmm. that is force, to force people to do it at, by the barrel of a gun is fundamentally immoral, right? Mm -hmm. Because people who, who don't want to voluntarily do something there's right. a reason that they don't want to do it, you know. There's there's a reason. Like like, well, like business people don't go into business to lose money, right? Uh, I mean, that would you say sense. that we didn't we didn't want to go to the moon as a society? Would you think that if you like took a poll among people and uh, you know if you took a vote, would you say that people would not want to have gone to the moon at in 1970? It doesn't matter. I mean, to me, it doesn't really matter. Like whether whether we went to the moon or not, I have no idea how long it would have taken. Let's say if government had not intervened, how long it would have taken. Uh, right. Let's say for for you know a private a private company to to uh -huh. develop uh, technology to go to the moon, mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is, you know, if there's no demand for it, <clears throat> then <laughs> there you know then there shouldn't be a company because if you try well, to artificially create a demand, you are you on. are introducing force and violence into a peaceful society by uh -huh. doing that. Uh huh. That's, but that's what I'm look, but assist. But if you look at the free market, there can be demand for something, but yeah. No business may be willing to take the risk to produce the supply, right? Like something may like, – like I'm saying, um, every, every exploration into a market, a new market that doesn't yet exist, it has risk associated with it, right? And businesses are necessarily both short-sighted and selfish. Businesses are short-sighted because they want to do something today that is going to secure – their livelihood and success tomorrow. They're not necessarily looking for what's going to be good for every, like going to be good for everyone else in 20 years, 50 years, a hundred years. They're not necessarily looking at that sort of timeline. They're looking at the Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 timeline. They're looking at what is going to make our investors happy? What is going to keep us in business? What is going to allow us to take home a salary every, uh, tomorrow? And what is going to keep our business going a few years from now? They're not necessarily looking at the effects of pollution on 
our, uh, our, you know, on our ecology or, or how, you know, all of our pollution is contributing towards this possible global warming effect or how getting to the moon t- uh, in 10 years is going to allow us to build colonies on other planets in 500 years. They're not looking at these sorts of timelines. They're looking at how risky is this venture? Is it going to make me money in the short term? Is it going to allow my business to grow in the long term? Uh, and that's basically what a business is looking for. They're looking for a, sh- a short-sighted type of view in, you know, in the scope of a couple of years to maybe 10 years at the max or something. And they're looking at what is good for me, what is good for my business, not what is good for society, what is good for everyone. And that's where I think that bi- uh, business stops and some other structure or some other sort of um, uh, some other sort of representative structure of everyone's interest uh, begins. That's my theory. Okay, so so two things I'll I'll, I'll comment on. Um, the first thing is that that you're I I definitely agree that businesses, you know, fundamentally only care about their own profits. It's a selfish you know endeavor, mm-hmm. right? And you could say they're greedy, right? <laughs> um, and then the other thing is that you can uh, in a we, actual way, yes. When you talk about society, like we have to do what's good for society, that really <laughs> reminded me of what Hitler told his country before he exterminated millions of Jews. Right? We have to do what's good for society. Right? So what is good for society? <laughs> when a, when there's a, ruler, a big difference there, when though, a, because when, when a ruler talks about what's good for society, mm-hmm. he most often refers to what's you know, the destruction of individual rights, right? Because, you know, when you talk about society as a big blob, as like we're all, you know, one amorphous, you know, group of people, you are immediately destroying mm-hmm. individuality, right? And mm-hmm. and you can't do that because, you know, it's like there's no such thing as Republicans, Democrats, there's no such thing as, you know, black people or white people. It, they're just people, right? We're just people. You can say they're all white, but sure. they're all completely different. You know, you can say they're all Republican, but they're all completely different. You know, so you can't lump people into one amorphous blob like that. Um, and and once you begin to do that, you immediately destroy people's individuality, and you immediately begin to trample on their individual rights. And that is that is fundamentally the basis of pretty much every totalitarian regime in history. Right? <laughs> is the is the trampling of individual rights, which basically leads to a cascade effect of. Uh, Mass murder, genocide, politicide, democide, you know, things like that. So, so that's the first thing. And then the other thing is, you know, the profits is, is um, you know, businesses, yeah, businesses do care about their profits. That is the primary reason they are in business. They're not in business to lose money, right? Um, if they were, sure. they wouldn't be in existence, right? So, yep. so the only way that they can secure profits, you're right, that they're not looking, let's say, 10 years, 12, 20 years, 100 years, they're not looking that far. Um, but they don't. I don't think they really have to even because you know what their their function is in society is to satisfy consumer demand, right? So if they're satisfying consumer mm-hmm. demand, they are they are by definition creating benefit in society, increasing the wealth in society, uh, providing jobs for people, increasing the standard of living of those that that uh, benefit from that company, right? So mm-hmm. it is it is an endeavor of supreme selfishness and greed, but they don't function in a vacuum, right? All, a lot of people benefit from an enormous business like Walmart, you know? Everybody hates Walmart <laughs> because it's so huge. But imagine, mm-hmm. imagine Walmart just disappears tomorrow. How many people would just be thrown on the street unemployed, right? And destitute <laughs> because, because uh, you know, their livelihoods were just taken away from them, right? <clears throat> and, mm-hmm. and to a lot of people, that's their livelihood. You know, people who have low skill level they maybe that's their only um, you know option is to work at Walmart, right? So mm-hmm. or or any other fast food company. So like McDonald's too, right? Some people say you know they they work for slave wages. Well, you know if they could work at better businesses, they would. But obviously they're working there because that's their best option. So mm-hmm. so yeah. So in in uh, securing their profits, in securing their um, you know their growth, they must serve society they must satisfy consumer demand so <clears throat> so you want to you want to finish once you finish you, you say the last word and then we'll uh and then we'll uh we'll say goodbye 
Okay, sure. Um, so, so, so basically, um, businesses satisfy consumer demands, and and they they play nice, and they uh, they act with other people's interests in mind, so long as they have to, right? But basically, if there's a way to generate more profit that maybe uh, you know uh, incurs on other people's freedoms or or um, what have you, if they can do that in such a way where there's fewer negative repercussions, then maybe that's all right. So. I guess the whole my whole problem with this entire system is that um, once you have basically you're you're saying that military becomes a private endeavor, right? So people um, are allowed to produce whatever weapons they want and sell them to whoever they want. My big problem is that who is going to be able to afford all these amazing weapons? It's going to be the people with more money, right? It's going to be the people that are rich, people that are in charge of big businesses. And it's also going to be the businesses themselves, right? I mean, what's better, buying out another company for their entire worth or taking their company from them for, for no co- you know, very little cost to you, basically the cost of employing a bunch of <clears throat> military folks with, with guns and tanks and bombs and whatnot. Um, it's much easier to grow my, my business by taking, uh, taking over other businesses than it is for me to actually grow it through the means of, of you know, buying them out. So um, what I think would inevitably, inevitably occur here is you have – you know, businesses becoming larger and larger by <clears throat> taking other businesses by less than um, benevolent means. Um, um, and I see basically this becoming an, o- an oligarchy. Basically, it'll become, uh, you know, de facto, it'll become basically a society with the, the rich um, the rich members basically getting to dispense justice as they see fit. Um, if you don't agree with me, then talk to my tanks and, and bombs and such. <clears throat> and if you don't want to buy my, buy my products, well, I've bought, out, I've bought out, quote unquote, all the other businesses that do the same business as me. So you don't really have a choice. Uh, if your choices are Walmart or Walmart, you're going to go to Walmart. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that's essentially what I think would happen here. Um, if that wouldn't happen, if there wouldn't be natural demand for um, tanks and all these other weapons of, of destruction, right? If there wasn't any demand for that, then you have a different problem where you suddenly look like a very juicy target for Russia. So um, those are so- essentially what I think uh, would happen with this type of society, and, and that's basically why I'm against it. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I think you stated your, you stated your position well. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll. Uh, yeah, I'm getting a little tired, but yeah, uh, yeah, that's okay. So I was able to hold up a good argument. No problem. It was good. So, um, so this concludes the uh, part two, rather lengthy part two of our debate. Yeah. <laughs> with I'm looking uh, at the time now. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, with uh, with John Zimmerman. Um, yep. So I don't know if we'll be able to do a part three, but if we do, that would be nice. But <laughs> we'll see how. Yeah, that we'll goes. see. <laughs> um, all right. So then. Um, so that's it for this uh, this uh, debate, part two. Uh, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Uh, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Yep. Bye. Nice talking to you all. Bye-bye.